that's not good. Oh, I don't need this. I'm already late. Somebody will come. Anybody out there? Do you have a phone? No. Sorry. Somebody! Hello? There are two people stuck on an escalator and we need help. Now, would somebody please do something? Believe this. You gotta be kidding me. <laughs> well, then now let's do it. Well, good morning. It's so good to be here. Um, and it's good not just because, you know, I've been, been hopping up on free donuts for the last half hour. I mean, it's, it's good because the fact that I'm actually in church is, is kind of significant. Now, that sounds weird coming from a pastor, but I mean, for me, getting up and getting motivated on Sunday mornings, it's, it's a heavy thing. It's a big stretch for me. And it's not really like spiritual or theological that keeps me coming from church, coming to church. It's, it's cartoon. See, when I was a kid and we got extended cable... When we got like 25 channels, that was huge. Like, what are we going to do with all these channels? We had the USA Network. And on Sunday mornings, they had a cartoon bonanza, a cornucopia of 1970s cartoons all rolled together for five hours called the USA Cartoon Express. And it didn't come on any other days of the week. It came on on Sundays. And it ran from like 6 in the morning to 11 in the morning. And it was just this pure end in of like really weird 1970s cartoons. Because the artists were doing things in the 70s that you probably shouldn't talk about in church. Like inhaling things that made really weird cartoons. But I loved them. Because I didn't get to see them any other days of the week. I'm talking about like cartoons like Grape Ape. It's about an ape who happens to be purple, thus grape ape. But he just wasn't a purple ape. He was a three-story tall purple ape. Get into all kinds of shenanigans. It came on on Sunday mornings. That's when I wanted to watch it. And there's, I'm talking like cartoons like Jabber Jaws. He was a, a sharp-tongued, slick shark who dressed as a hipster. He was hip before hip was cool, all right? And he's just going around getting all kinds of... I'm talking about cartoons like the Hair Bear Bunch. It's a group of bears that lived in a zoo. Doesn't sound that exciting. Wait, they're in a band. And they sneak out of the zoo because they got to go play gigs at the clubs. Oh, and did I mention they all have afros? Like, who wouldn't want to watch that? And at the end of the USA Cartoon Express, they had the Hanna-Barbera Laugh Olympics. And when you're seven, you don't think that Space Ghost and Jabber Jaws can be in the same cartoon. That is scientifically impossible when you're seven years old. But they did it. Every week, all the cartoons would come together and they would face off against one another. The good cartoons versus the bad guy cartoons. And they'd have all these competitions. And about the time that I'm watching that, weekend and week out, my mom would come in and say, it's time to go to church. What a buzzkill. And who wants to go to church when Space Ghost and Jabber Jaws are going up against other the do-right? Like, who wants to miss this? And it didn't help that I'm all hyped up on sugar by that point. Because I'd get up at like 3 a.m. like seven-year-olds do, and I would make myself breakfast. I'd have my Rice Krispies, because we never had cool cereal when I was a kid. So I just dumped a whole bunch of sugar in it, and it made it awesome. And I would drink coffee. Yeah, I made coffee when I was seven. And I, it was like this much coffee and like this much milk and about this much sugar. You just really chewed on it more than anything. So I'm all hyped up on, on sugar. I'm all, I'm all fired up because I'm watching these cartoons. And there comes my mom telling me it's time to go to church. I didn't take it well any of the weeks. So the fact that I'm here is a big deal. See, one day we're leaving and I said, I'm not doing this. Who wants to go to church when there's an amazing episode of Space Ghost on. And so we got to the front porch and I'm just bitter. And I think the sugar was doing something with my brain. And I'm like, this is it. Today is the day I get my freedom. Today is the day I get my independence. Today is the day I break the iron fist of Pat Reynolds over my life. So I took off running. 
And as I shared last week, I was a husky kid. So when you take off running, you know, it seems like the best plan possible. I only made it about seven steps and I was winded. <laughs> Gasping for breath. I'm like, what? what's my new course of action here? And that's when I saw my car, our family's car. And I'm like, I'll hide behind the car. You're like, that's not a really good plan. I didn't mention it's a 1978 Caprice Classic. These cars are eight miles long, people. 55 tons of American steel went into making these things. They're enormous. When I was in driver's ed, this is the car we learned how to drive in. Because I don't know if you know this, 15-year-olds are terrible drivers. So in the Caprice Classic, you could back it up into a building. The building would collapse upon it. You can engage it and drive and move forward without a scratch, a dent, nothing. <laughs> Pure, massive American industry right there. And so I ducked behind it. And my mom didn't really know what was going on yet until she saw the look in my eyes and I made my first costly mistake. I looked at Pat Reynolds and I went, ooh. <laughs> mom went to the side of the car that I was on. I ducked back to the other side of the car. She went to that side of the car. I ran to the front of the car. She went to the front of the car. I went to the back of the car. She went to the back of the car. I went back to the side of the car that I began on. We went around and around and around. Pat Reynolds chasing her chubby, hyped up on sugar kid all the way around our Caprice Classic. And now our neighbors are coming out to go to church or get their papers. And they see her chasing me around. And I wouldn't stop because today I'm going to have my independence. Today I'm watching cartoons. And mom went back into the house and I'm like, freedom, I did it. This is a huge day. This is going to be in history books in the future. And then like a John Wayne movie, the front door, the screen door of our house, ee, it screeched open and out walks my mom, followed by my dad, my oldest sister, my second oldest sister, our dog, our family parakeet the offensive line, the Miami Dolphins, some members of the police department, a couple off-duty firefighters, the Third Army, United States Army, the Coast Guard. They all come out of my house. I don't know how they got there. The Harlem Globetrotters were in there, I think. They all come walking out, and they hold hands. They join hands, and they begin to march towards me. And I'm like, this is amazing, because all those people are in my house, and they're in incredible cadence. How did they plan this? And they start marching towards me, and I'm like, oh, I wasn't planning for this. I wasn't prepared. And I, psh, I bumped into that Caprice Classic. And when my dad saw me make that costly mistake, the second one I made that day, he said, whip! And like half of them stopped, and the rest kept moving, creating this whip that was closing in around me. I had nowhere to go, so I made the third costly mistake of my day. I dove into the back seat of the Caprice Classic. Before I could get up, the automatic locks went on, the windows were up, and the door shut, and it was just me and my mom in the back seat. At first, I'm like, this is okay, because there's like 50 feet of back seats, his big old bench. I'm like, well, as long as she stays down there. But like a ninja, she pounced upon me, and she began to wear me out. The kind of spanking that you moms do when you're really, really angry, that, the spanking well, that you do probably every day with your kids, all right? It's a, and she began to just, just go off on my rear end, just spanking, spanking, spanking. And she was doing that like half talk, half like wolf screech, half Pentecostal speaking in tongues. It was all happening. And she was like, you will have he ha, roar, never again. I did not sit down until 1993. I was a junior in high school when the doctor finally took away my prescribed donut. Not a good donut you eat like we do out here. Like the inflatable ones. All because I wanted to go to church. <laughs> Have you ever been stuck? Like absolutely stuck. That, that feeling that I had when I was surrounded by my family and most of the off-duty police officers in my neighborhood, the Harlem Globetrotters, Metal Lark Lemon throwing basketballs at my face. Have you ever been stuck? So then you know how offsetting it can be, how uncomfortable, how overwhelming it can be. If you felt that way, maybe you're feeling that way today. It's good that you're here. Because we're going to do this series for the next five weeks called Stuck. And we're going to meet people who are stuck. Maybe in a, an issue, maybe in a circumstance, maybe in a pain, maybe in their own mistakes. They were stuck. And they kept trying and trying and trying to get unstuck. And they remained more stuck. 
And then they met somebody who gave them answers, who gave them love, who gave them support. His name was Jesus. And we're going to meet some of these people over the next couple of weeks. And I'm looking forward to this journey that we're on, especially for those of us here that are feeling stuck today, feeling in the midst of that. All of our stories that we're going to go through are found in the book of John. So if you have a Bible and you want to go there, go to the, to the book of John. It's the fourth book in the New Testament. to John chapter 3, and that's where we're going to start this week as we begin this journey through Stuck Together. Now, John is an interesting book. It's called a gospel. There are four of them, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And they all gave some insight, some understanding, some context to this man, Jesus, who came, who lived, who ministered, who died, and who rose again. And they began to give us insight to it. And John's one of them. John, in his own book, is actually described as the disciple, the apostle whom Jesus loved. So he had a very close connection, an intimate friendship, relationship with this man, Jesus. And to all these people that we're going to meet over the next five weeks, he was an eyewitness to these encounters, to these conversations that Jesus would have him. He was there to see it. So it wouldn't be a big stretch for us to think that John probably sensed frustration towards him. He probably sensed judgment towards him. He probably even felt some sympathy towards him. Perhaps he felt all of these things as he's watching Jesus interact with these people who are stuck. John states in his book, in chapter 20, he states the purpose of why he wrote this gospel, why he wrote this perspective of what Jesus did. He says this, I've written these things so that you may believe in Jesus, that you may believe he is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life. And one of the ways that John helps the reader, you and I get that, is by showing conversations, stories, these long moments. His gospel's very different than the other ones because a lot of times they were more condensed, the other gospels. And they had these little pithy statements here and there. And like, here's this thing that happened, here's the next thing that happened. Here's this person, then there's this next person. John took his time. He gave long conversations. He gave reports of, of Jesus interacting with them. In my preparation, getting ready for today, I came across a, a commentary. One of my favorite ones is by a guy named William Barclay. He was from Ireland and just this wonderful writer and grasp of scripture. And he wrote that, that John gives us these perspectives, these conversations, where, where, where a person will first come to Jesus with a question. And then he says, then, then Jesus would respond with something that's kind of difficult to understand. He said, then, then that, that original person will, will misunderstand what Jesus just said, and Jesus will respond by saying something that's even more difficult to understand. We'll see this pattern even today, and we'll see it throughout the next couple of weeks, this pattern of person coming with a question, Jesus responding, then misunderstanding, and then Jesus responding again. And, and, and Dr. Barclay said this. He says, Jesus uses this method in order that we may see others thinking things through for themselves, and so we may do the same. We have these stories to see some people who are stuck and how through their, their conversation, this connection with Jesus, they, they start to work it out. And perhaps, just perhaps, you and I can have that same experience, that same feeling, that same opportunity to work it out and not be so stuck anymore. In John chapter 3, that's where we're going to go today and where we're going to spend our time. And I want to introduce you to this first person who was stuck, stuck in, in, in this place in their life. Let me pick up by, by reading verse 1 for us. It says this. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. So we meet this first person. It says he's a Pharisee. What is a Pharisee? A Pharisee was one of the, the leading religious groups in the culture at that time. They were a religious society. There was actually three of them in the culture at this point. And the Pharisees were probably the largest the most powerful and the most verbal, the most vocal of all these groups. Their name means, the Pharisee literally means separated. They actually had a nickname that they loved to go by that said that they were loyal to God or loved by God. And they were so verbal, they weren't going to let you forget this, that they're the ones who are loyal to God. They're the ones who are loved by God. And how did they get this way? They got this way by following rules, a set of instructions that they thought is what you needed to do to have the love of God, to show yourself loyal to God. They had rule after rule. They had step after step. They had book after book telling you what to do if you want God to love you. 
And what they did is create a religion. They created a religion of how you're supposed to do these things. What probably began as maybe even sincere obedience became a following of checklists and rules and boxes you had to check off. Many of them that were written by the Pharisees themselves. And they said, if you do this, if you're good enough, maybe, just maybe, God's going to love you. And in the midst of this, they got stuck. They got stuck in their own religion. Nicodemus himself got stuck. In verse 2, it says, this man came to Jesus by night. Now, let's stop there. It says by night. That's something that's put in there on purpose. And this isn't night like, hey, let's go out tonight, meaning 6.30 or 7 or 8 if you're really hip. He's saying night like late, like 9.30. That's when I'm in my pajamas, typically in bed, all right, because I'm an old man already. Night, like deep, dark night, when you don't go do these things, it says that he came to Jesus then. Why would he come at night? He'd come at night not because it was convenient. He came at night because it was safe. He didn't want to be seen talking to Jesus because Jesus very quickly showed himself as different from the Pharisees, outside of their rules, not wanting to follow the guidelines that they said you had to follow to know God. And so Nicodemus, this Pharisee, comes to Jesus at night because he doesn't want people to see him. It's a safe place for him to be. But it's not just literally that he came to him at night. I think that there's a figurative thing here, that Nicodemus came at night because he was in darkness emotionally, mentally, spiritually. A few years ago, I went on, a, on an overnight caving trip to the Lost Sea over in Sweetwater, Tennessee, and it was there, we kind of did the normal tour. And then as all the kind of the paid guests left, we were going to stay for the night. All of a sudden our tour guide was like, all right, let's go. And he just kind of climbs over this rock and dives down into this hole. And we just followed him. And it was the coolest night. We were just climbing around in the mud, going all these holes, all these kinds of stuff. He brings us to this one cave way deep in the mountain. He said, all right, now I want you to do what I'm saying. I want you all to turn off your headlamps, your flashlights, turn off all that light. And don't turn them on until I tell you, just trust me. And I'm like, well, I've known you for 30 minutes, so of course I'm going to trust you. So we crank off our lights and it was the darkest dark I've ever been. It was just so black. You couldn't see anything in front of you. And it was like offsetting, like kind of didn't know where you were anymore and how you're like, wasn't that person next to me? How close are they? Get away from me. And it felt like the walls closing in. It was overwhelming. And he said, if you stayed down here in this darkness, just for a few months, you would go blind and you'd go blind because your, your eyes are going to keep searching for light. Even when there isn't, they're going to keep looking for light, and eventually the muscles in your eyes are going to wear out, and you'll go blind. Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night searching for the light, and he's so stuck in his religion that he's going to keep, going to keep going, keep going, keep going, and I think he comes to Jesus because he's at the end of this search He's like, I've tried everything else. And he felt himself. He knew he was going blind. Many of you guys are here today on like one last desperate invitation. Come, just come to church with me once. Come check out the gathering with me just once. And just, you know, hoping maybe you'll, you'll get it this time. Maybe you can just be good enough is what you're thinking. Know this, Nicodemus was going blind and so are you. Nicodemus was, was searching and searching and searching and so are you. You're looking for the light because you've been created that way. You've been made that way to seek that light, to find that light. And Nicodemus comes to him at night and it picks up in verse two saying that he said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who comes from God for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. The emphasis here is on the word do. Did you notice that? He says it twice, real quick in one sentence. No one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Do you hear what he's saying? He's talking religion here. He's saying, you do these things, so tell me what you do so I can do them now. God's hand is on you because of all this effort that you're putting out, right? This is how it works, right, Jesus? Give me the secret here. I want, I want the special sauce to figure this out, Jesus. What do you do that I'm not doing so I can start to do it so I can be where you are doing those things as well? The work effort of religion is what's alive here in just this one statement. 
He's saying that only when you're doing something is God's hand going to be upon you. Only when you're doing the right things, acting the right way, showing the right behavior, surely that means God is with you, right? That's what Nicodemus is after here. It shows his stuckness. His stuckness is around the idea that religion is a work-based enterprise. Work enough, do good enough, be good enough, you're going to make it, right? That, that's, doesn't that make sense? And that's what Nicodemus is looking for. So it's good that he's offering this question to Jesus because Jesus shows something very different. Where, work, where religion is a work-based enterprise, Jesus starts to show that salvation is a being-centered experience. It's about where you are and how God can interact with you. Jesus speaks up and Jesus gives him his answer. In verse 3, it says, Jesus answered him, truly, truly. Anytime you see Jesus say something twice, you know, listen up to that, okay? Listen up to whatever Jesus says, all right? Because that's just a good thing to say in church. But when he says, truly, truly, he's trying to get Nicodemus' attention. He's trying to get our attention. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He says, unless you're born again. He's saying, you've got to be born. You have to have this experience. This has to be something that happens to you. The original language of the New Testament, it was typically in Greek is how it was written. And and the phrase born again in the Greek, it's hard to translate into English. Our, Our language is too set and specific sometimes. We have to describe it in one word or two words at best. But in the Greek, it it was this kind of big, ambiguous statement. So when he says born again, it could mean born again. It could mean born anew. It could mean born from above. So let me give you a good pastoral answer to which one it is. Yes. When John says born again, he's talking about all three. He's saying you you need to be born again. You need to be born anew. You need to be born from above. Isn't that where we want the gift to come from? If we're going to be gifted... From, from anywhere, why not from above? If we want to know God and know his kingdom, if we want to see the kingdom of God, which is what Jesus says, wouldn't we rather have that come from above, from the kingdom of God? That's a place that you get a gift receipt that you can't return it to. You can't be like, hey, you know, go back to Dillard's. I got this born again thing. It's not working out for me. So I'd like to return it and get some pants. He's giving us a gift that can't be exchanged, a gift that will never go away, a gift that will change us. And he's saying, you have to have this to see the kingdom of God. And this idea of being born again, it echoes throughout the New Testament over and over again. It it rolls out. In 1 Peter chapter 1, it says that we are born again through God's mercy. Like we talked about last week, how deep the mercy of God is. Later in chapter 1, in verses 22 and 23, he says that that when you're born again, it's it's not perishable. It's an imperishable gift. In James chapter 1, verse 18, it says, the word of God makes us new so we can be born again. In Titus chapter 3, it says that it's the working of God's salvation that allows us to be born again. In Romans chapter 6, it talks about how we die like Christ died so we can rise again and have new life and be born again. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, it talks about how we're babies in Christ because we're born again. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11, it says we're created again. Born anew. In Galatians chapter 6, verse 15, it says that in Christ we are new creations, born again. In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 22 through 24, it talks about how we're created new in righteousness. Again and again and again, it talks about how God wants you and I and all of us to be born again. And that's not something we can earn or buy or be good enough for. It's simply something that just is offered to us that we receive in our beings. It's something that we become. He says this to Nicodemus and he's wanting Nicodemus and everyone here today to experience something life-changing, life-altering, especially those of us here who are trying to make this connection with God through our efforts and our behavior. Jesus is being centered and we must be as well. Our being can connect to the kingdom of God. It can see the kingdom of God, this offer that Jesus makes here. He wants us to see it. 
And it's out of the depths of God's love that we have this. It's out of the depths of his love that, that we get this, that there's something spiritual here. There's something special, significant. So we must realize something here. Nicodemus and his religious friends would want us to work so hard that God has to show us love. But what Jesus is saying here is we don't motivate God's love. God's love motivates us. It's something that happens in our very core, our being, who we are as people when we're born again. So surely by saying all this, Nicodemus is going to get it, right? I'm like, this makes sense. When you really stop and think, yes, he's going to get it. So let's look at how he responds and, and grabs hold of this in verse 4. It says this, Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born again when he's old? He doesn't seem to be getting, does he? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Nicodemus asks a religious question, one that's asked when you're stuck. How do I do this? Do I have to climb back into my mother's womb? How uh, do, do I have to do this to be born again? How do I do this? Do you hear it? Do you sense the doing that's coming out of this? Well, I'll be honest with you. Pat Reynolds does not want this climbing back into her womb again. It's the last thing she wants today. If she was here today, she'd be like, Pat out. And she would leave. She'd just go have lunch. I'm not letting that monster climb back into me. I've done it once and I barely made it. But this is what Nicodemus is saying. He's like, well, tell me what I need to do. Nicodemus is literally saying, if I need to climb back into my mother's womb to have this peace, I'll do it. William Barclay, this guy I've been talking about all morning, he says this, Nicodemus is up against the eternal problem, the problem of a man who wants to be changed and cannot change himself. There is no way that I or you or Nicodemus can do enough to be born again. And that is a beautiful, freeing truth. It's a powerful reality because trying to earn God's love, trying to earn his favor, trying to get him to give you being born again is not only impossible, it's exhausting. Why would we want to do this? But the fact of the matter is I've spent much of my life and many of you here today are stuck trying to get God to pay attention to you, trying to get God to show you favor. Look how good I'm acting. Look how good I'm being. Look how good I'm thinking. Look how good I'm dressed. Look at my behavior. Look at my effort. Look at my work. Look at all the things I do. It's impossible, friends. It's exhausting. That's not faith. It's function. And Jesus doesn't want Nicodemus to simply function. He doesn't want you and I to simply function. He wants us to have faith. So he responds to him. Starting in verse five, Jesus answers his question. He says this, truly, truly. Remember, we gotta pay attention when he says this. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear it sound, but you do not know where it comes from and where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. In my unofficial count last night, Jesus says you must be born four times. Your being must be born again. God must allow you to be born anew, be born from above. He uses the word do or work or effort zero times. Zero times he says we work to get this. Four times he says God moves on behalf of you. He does the work. He shows the effort. He pours out his love and says be born again. And he's not talking about baptism here. He says you gotta be, you gotta be born of water and the spirit. Because the, the concept of baptism, Christian baptism, that many of us have experienced has been a powerful experience in our life, a, a symbol of the change that's happened to us and we want it publicly to be known. The idea of that did not show up until after John was written. It hadn't been instituted yet. And he's not talking about how Jesus himself was baptized by John the Baptist earlier in the Gospels. 
Because Jesus doesn't make that same request of Nicodemus. He doesn't say, hey, do what I did and then you'll have it. Because that would be doing, it would be work, it would be effort. He's talking about something larger here. He's talking about something bigger. He gives a reference using the words water and spirit. And those were Old Testament references. And Jesus knew that Nicodemus would hear this because Nicodemus was a religious leader. He was a teacher of the law. He was a teacher of the scriptures. And three times in the Old Testament, the idea of water and spirit moving, working on behalf of people was when God showed up and did something enormous. The idea of water is, is a cleansing is what Jesus is getting at, our sins being washed away. The idea of spirit is power, that we would now have the power to not be in this mess again, to not be stuck again. And without this, Jesus says that we cannot enter this, the kingdom of God. A couple of verses ago, he said, without being born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Now he's saying, you cannot enter altogether. You can't have this unless you're born of water and spirit. The kingdom of God is this huge concept. I wish we had more time to unpack it. But essentially, it, it means for you and I and for Nicodemus that we accept the invitation and we are adopted into God's family. We have an acceptance into his higher kingdom, his power. And with that comes all of the power and rights and privilege that comes with being a child in his kingdom. Our whole being becomes different. We get to be somewhere differently. This is what Jesus is driving at. That's why when he prays, he says, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He's saying that, that the, the kingdom of God can be here and later, and later and now. And you get to be part of that. This idea of getting to come into this kingdom. He's saying, Nicodemus, it's here for you. I'm giving this to you. I want you to just simply receive it. You don't have to pay me for it. You don't have to work to get in. You don't have to show a certain effort. It's here offered to you. And Nicodemus has the choice just like you and I have the choice. Do we receive it and just let it become Part of our lives change who we are. What we're offered here is the difference between do or be, behave or believe, effort or experience. Nicodemus is given the choice, and you and I are given the choice. Jesus says in verse 7, don't marvel at what I'm saying. To marvel at something means to simply be astonished, amazed, overwhelmed by something, but never engage it, just to simply watch. Wow, I can't believe that's happening. I'm marveling right now. I'm marveling at this. But the legs never move. You never get any closer to it. Jesus is saying, Nicodemus, don't miss this. Listen to what I'm saying here. Be, don't do. Receive, don't put forth this effort. You're missing it, Nicodemus. Stop marveling and receive have this. He says, the wind blows where it wishes. What Jesus is saying here to Nicodemus and to you and me is this. When God pours out, when God moves, when God blows, when his spirit comes, it comes big. It moves big over your lives, over my life, over our lives. Back when our family was living up in Clarksville, right there in the midst of Tornado Alley, and the very first time that, that a big storm blew through and all the sirens are going off and the TV's going, you know, get to low ground, hide out, sacrifice the kids you don't like, you know, they're saying all those things. You know what I did? I went up and stood on the porch because I'm an idiot. It's like, whoa, look at this wind. I wasn't looking at the wind. I was feeling it. I was experiencing it. This power was moving in that I couldn't harness, that I could never create on my own. I just simply sat and experienced it. That's what Jesus is saying to Nicodemus. That's what he's saying to you and I. The wind will blow, it will move. This water, this spirit, this work of God is coming and it wants to overwhelm you. So for those of you who are asking, what do I do to get this? The answer is nothing. There's nothing you can do to make God's wind blow your way. There's nothing that you can do to, to finally see God's kingdom, to have God's kingdom. Our only response is to receive it. 
to realize that our efforts will never get us there. Our work will never get us there. No matter what we do, we won't get there. He moves towards you because he loves you. It's at the depth of who he is. He cares for you. He wants to show you mercy. We simply allow the love of God to pour over us, to blow around us, to change us from the inside out. And, God, and Jesus, in this conversation, in this moment, he gives Nicodemus an incredible word. Later in the conversation, he offers to him what has become probably the most famous Bible verse there is. He speaks to Nicodemus, John 3.16. He says this for Nicodemus, a Pharisee who came at night, a guy who was stuck and couldn't get unstuck, a guy who was working and working and working, trying to earn this love. You realize how amazing it is? Nicodemus is not only the first person to hear John 3.16, Jesus says John 3.16 to Nicodemus, for Nicodemus. Jesus could have said, man, he never gets it. I'm done. I'm going home. It's late. But Jesus instead looks at him and says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. That's Nicodemus' verse. But because of the mercy of God, we get to read it and experience it. Today he says, for God. It starts with God. Do you notice that? It doesn't say, because Nicodemus worked so hard. It doesn't say that. It initiates with God. From the very beginning, God is the one who is at work in this. We think that God has to be pacified and persuaded to forgive us. Friends, that's religion. It won't work and it will remain stuck. Jesus says, for God so loved. This is the ministry of God. This is the depths of who he is. This is his love at work. Religion thinks it's easier to see God, to think of God as one who looks at us with anger and disgust, mad at us all the time. That's easier, isn't it? You have so many friends that go, I can't get on with that God who's just so angry. Be like, show me. How does that show anger and disgust? It doesn't. He loves us. It says, he, for God so loved the world. Now we see the width and the breadth and the depth of God's plan. How big his love is. It could have easily said, and God could have gotten away with it. It could have said, for God so loved the good, the pleasant, the hardworking, the well-behaved, the well-groomed. Which means most of us here today would be in huge trouble because I've seen you. But it doesn't. It's not limited to a nation, to a people, to a color, to a tribe, to a church. It's not limited to effort or behavior. He loves you. He loves Nicodemus. He loves me. And he loves us so much that it says he gave his son. All of a sudden, God takes on a whole new form. He is a father. A father who gave gift his son sacrificed him so we can connect. A father who sacrificed his son so other sons and daughters could know him and connect to him. Do you see how deep that love is? How great that mercy is? How amazing his offering is to us? St. Augustine, who is a, called a father of the church, he was an early Christian leader. He helped them form and understand who they were. And many of us sit here today because of that ministry and effort that he put forth. He says this, God loves each one of us as if there were only one of us to love. God loves you as if you're the only one that needs that love today. God loves me as if I'm the only one who needs that love today. How deep the Father's love is for us, for Nicodemus. God loves each one of us, even if we're stuck in ourselves, even if we're stuck in our ways, even if we're stuck in our effort, because he wants to see you become unstuck. And he wanted Nicodemus to be unstuck. He wants all of us to step out of effort and trying and doing and work and religion and finally be children who can experience his love. Will you pray with me this morning? God, thank you for Jesus. His great love, his great sacrifice offered to each of us. How deep your love is. God, help us. 
God, lead us. God, carry us. God, do for us what we can't do for ourselves. Break us out of the stuckness of our life so we can experience the power of your spirit, the washing of your water, so we might live lives that show people that love and enjoy that love every day. Thank you for loving each of us as we are, where we are, who we are, and providing us the opportunity to know you. May today be a day where we embrace and experience that. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. I'm so glad so you guys, I'm so glad you guys clapped for me. It's, it makes me feel awesome, all right? Um, so glad you're here today in our first week of Stuck. I want to do a couple of things, all right? First, I'm going to give you some homework. I don't know if I'm allowed to give homework. I don't know if it's in my job description, but I'm wearing the Sonic drive through earpiece microphone thingy, so I'm going to do whatever I want right now, okay? And Paula can sort it out later. I'm going to give you some homework, okay? John 3.16 is that, it's that verse, and it's powerful. Hopefully you heard it and experienced it today. If you've never memorized it, I want to challenge you to memorize it this week. Um, memorizing scripture is a powerful, uh, a powerful tool that we can have in, in our hearts and our lives to help us embrace God's word more. If you've memorized John 3.16, I want you to memorize John 3.17, the one after it, which is pretty significant too. I use the Fighter app on my, on my iPhone. It's by John Piper's ministry. It's a, a great application that helps me memorize scripture. And it's something I've been doing more this year to try and embrace God's word and make it more a part of my life so I can bring back scripture to my mind and my heart, especially in those days where I feel stuck. And maybe you will too. I sit in meetings and do scripture memory all day long. People are like, wow, Joel's really taking these notes down. No, I'm not. I'm just working on scripture. It's how I roll. But I'd love for, to challenge you guys to do that. Your other homework is this. See, again, I don't know if I can set up two homework assignments, but I'm going to. Uh, the second one is this. Next week, we're in John chapter four. We're going one chapter over, and we're going to meet a woman who, who has a conversation with Jesus. I want to challenge you to read John chapter four this week. It's a pretty short one. It won't take you long. So read it two or three times. Get, get a hang, an understanding of this, of this chapter. And I want, to put you, I want you to, as you read it, put yourself in the place of that woman. Put yourself in the place of Jesus. Put yourself in the place of his disciples who are watching this go on and experience that. And maybe put yourself as that, as that person who's stuck because she's stuck in her relationships. And many of us here today are in that stuckness. And invite somebody to come with you next week and join us for this next part of, of the Stuck series. Because so many of us here know somebody that's going through a painful divorce or just coming out of one or they're in a separation. Maybe they've lost a loved one, a, a family member, a friend, and it's been really painful on them. They're stuck because their relationships are what make the world for them. And they're using their relationships in a place that only Jesus wants to take over. And I want to encourage you to come back and join us and bring somebody with us as we continue to explore this idea of being stuck in the freedom that Jesus offers to us. So there's your homework, there's your assignments. And with that, your last assignment is this, go and have a great Sunday. We love you guys. God bless, see you later. More applause, yes.